So as we uh, begin looking uh, more closely at Plato's Fido, um, I have a very nice <clears throat> PDF scan of an old translation, an old edition of, uh, of the Fido. Uh, it actually comes from the Hannah Arendt uh, collection at Bard College. She was a wonderful philosopher, post-war uh, philosopher, and they saved he saved her personal books and, and they're scanning them. Uh, I came across it by chance, but I just thought it was great. So all the, all the, the margin comments are her pencil comments. I suppose she was, I think she was using it in her classes. Um, she certainly, uh, a lot of it's in Greek. A lot of her, her comments are in Greek. So, uh, but you can skip the introduction, the translator's introduction. Um, first several pages uh, and go straight to the actual beginning of the dialogue here. Uh, and like many of Plato's dialogues, it has a very dramatic introduction. It's actually, the whole thing is narrated by this, this man, Fido, who knew Socrates and was there. And he's, the setup here is that, he, that he's telling the whole, he's, he's, he's giving an account of the whole conversation to someone else, a Kekrates. Uh, but that Fido was there, Fido knew Socrates very well. Uh, Fido himself became a kind of a philosopher, a teacher of philosophy, I believe. And um, it, it's all being told by him, which is very typical uh, of Plato's dialogues, that someone recites a whole hours long conversation, um, which is an issue in itself. But in any case, uh, that's that's the setup here. Um, um, it's missing pages two and three. Uh, you know that's okay. Um, Socrates is in jail. He has been awaiting the the death sentence. Uh, he has been convicted probably about a month before of um, uh, various crimes, most prominent of which I believe is corrupting the youth of Athens. And there's a whole set of dialogues uh, that. Uh, relate to this this central event of his his trial and conviction, um, but his friends have, have have come to see him on this day. It is the day, and uh, I think what we're basically missing here is some explanation of why he was in jail uh, a little bit longer than, than than convicts usually were, and. His wife <clears throat> has come to see him. His wife and, and sons have come to see him, and he dismisses them fairly quickly, uh, and then just begins to speak to his his friends. And that's what, what what happens for the rest of the dialogue. And there's some very interesting stuff here. Too much, really, to 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 try to take account uh, in, in in these videos. I'm, I'm, going to ask you to read it and, and to enjoy it and to work hard and, and, and its work. It's, it's a great work of philosophy. It's very challenging, but it's also a great work of literature. It's in translation, but it's still a great read, I think. Uh, after some interesting things happen, philosophically, the really interesting stuff begins here on page five, where... Um, Socrates, uh, in reference to a mutual friend, uh, Socrates right here says, uh, tell Evenus this, Sebes, and bid him for farewell from me, and tell him to follow me as quickly as he can, if he is wise. I, it seems, shall depart today, for, what, for that is the will of the Athenians. And then Simeon says, what strange advice to give Evenus, Socrates, I have often met him, and from what I have seen of him, I think that he is certainly not at all the man to take it if he can help it. And remember, Socrates has said, tell Evenus to follow me as quickly as he can, if he is wise, that is, quickly as he can into death. And Simeus is like, what, what, a, what, strange, what a strange thing to say, follow you quickly into death. Why would you say such a thing? Uh, and Socrates says, well, what uh, is not even as a philosopher? Uh, yes, I suppose so, replied Simeus. Then even as will wish to die, he said, and so will every man who is worthy of having any part in this study. Oh, I wish I could read Hannah Arendt's uh, 
Greek here. Uh, she's sometimes she puts the Greek term in the in the margins, and I'm sure that that's the Greek term for what's translated here as study. Mm, looks like pregnant. Anyway, doesn't matter. Uh, which is a you know interesting thing to say, and is the first uh, philosophical topic that's taken up in the dialogue, and, and this is a very famous aspect of the dialogue. Once because Socrates is basically saying that that philosophers should, should welcome death. I think it's often misunderstood uh, in terms of why he would say such a thing, uh, but it is fairly well known that that philosophy itself is a is a kind of a practice uh, from uh, pre pre practice for death. Uh, that philosophy is a preparation for death, uh, but he doesn't mean it really in the sense that being thinking about philosophy makes dying easier or. Um, makes us more stoic. Uh, <laughs> um, he has a very specific reason. Uh, and if we can, uh, geez. Uh, b -b 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 uh, just pause here for a second. So I'm fine. Okay, so after um, Socrates has made this very striking uh, statement that philosopher welcomes the philosopher welcomes death, he, he's he or Plato is, is is quick to say that doesn't mean that one should commit suicide that that, that that's impious uh, that's wrong to commit suicide, but that I say you shouldn't hasten death, uh, but you shouldn't be afraid of it, and and you should welcome it actually. Uh, he says, this is at the bottom of page uh, eight. Socrates says, but I wish now to explain to you my judges, which is an allusion, of course, to his trial. Uh, why it seems to me that a man who has really spent his life in philosophy has reason to be of good cheer when he is about to die and may well hope after death to gain in the other world the greatest good. I will try to show you, Simeus and Sebes, how this may be. The world, perhaps, does not see that those who rightly engage in philosophy study only dying and death. And if this be true, it would be surely strange for a man all through his life to desire only death, and then when death comes to him to be vexed at it, when it has been his study and his desire for so long. Now, that is a very strange thing to say. Um, you know, why would you study death and be um, to desire only death? I mean, what, he's, he's got to give us a conception of death that would make all this make sense. Uh, and he does, I think. And this is at the top of page nine. Uh, right here, he asks Simeus, do we believe death to be anything? We do, replied Simeus. And do we not believe it to be the separation of the soul from the body? There it is. Okay. Do we not believe it to be the separation of the soul from the body? Does not death mean that the body comes to exist by itself, separated from the soul? and that the soul exists by herself, separated from the body. What is death but that? It is that. Okay. So uh, if, <clears throat> if death is the separation of soul and body, uh, then how does that enable us to make better sense of Socrates' claim uh, on page 8 that uh, those who rightly engage in philosophy study only dying and death and that the philosopher actually desires death. Uh, well, um, what follows uh, in, in, in the next pages is really a very uh, astounding argument uh, that this separation of the soul from the body is better thought of as a liberation of the soul from the body. Um, that is that it, it's only when this separation takes place that the philosopher 
can get what he really wants. Uh, So maybe a good place to look would be on page 10. Socrates says, well, but what about the actual uh, acquisition of wisdom? If the body is taken as a companion in the search for wisdom, is it a hindrance or not? For example, do sight and hearing convey any real truth to men? Are not the very poets forever telling us that we neither hear nor see anything accurately? But if these senses of the body are not accurate or clear, the others will hardly be so, for they are all less perfect than these, are they not? Yes, I think so, certainly, he said. Then when does the soul attain truth? Okay, now, see, this is it, right? This is this, this, this daring, outrageous assertion that, that Socrates is going to make, and, and that is that the soul only attains truth after death. Uh, then when does the soul attain truth, he asked. We see that as often as she seeks to investigate anything in company with the body, the body leads her astray. True. Is it not by reasoning, if at all, that any real truth becomes manifest to her? Yes. And she reasons best, I suppose, when none of, none of the senses, whether hearing or sight or pain or pleasure, harasses her. When she has dismissed the body and released herself as far as she can, from all intercourse or contact with it. And so coming to be as much alone with herself as possible strives after real truth. So, uh, yeah, that it, it, it's the explanation of why the philosopher desires death, why the philosopher welcomes death, because the claim is that it's only after death. It's only after the body or the soul, excuse me, sheds the body, separates from the body, that it can find truth. So if the philosopher, who's literally the lover of knowledge, um, has been searching after truth all uh, their lives, and philosophers all their lives, and, and now that their souls have actually separated from the hindrances of the body, which have held them back from, from gaining that knowledge, they should welcome death. Uh, so it explains the the claim that the philosopher welcomes death, but it certainly raises other questions. Well, what do you mean? I mean, why is it that that the philosopher can only find absolute truth or real truth uh, after after death? Uh, we'll take that up in the next video.